Hi, everyone. Welcome to the OUM community. Hi, Ellen and Gabriel and Daryl and Mesh and Carrie. Hi, Shanda. <laughs> hi to those of you joining us via recording. Uh, hi to Anisha and Aaliyah. Really nice to have you. I'm Associate Professor Nicolette McGuire, welcome to our OUM Meet the Dean session with Dean Crystal Boone Robinson. We're really excited to have all of you here in person with us. And if you're joining us via recording, great to have you too. Um, and uh, Dean Boone Robinson, thank you so much for taking some time to chat with us. We know you have a really busy schedule. And um, Crystal and I get to see each other in a lot of administrative meetings, so I'm actually really excited to just like talk with her and <laughs> ask her some questions too. So welcome everyone to our conversation and welcome Dean Boone Robinson. How are you? I am good. <laughs> <laughs> so um, if you've been to our webinars before, welcome back and you know that we'll answer, um, sorry, we'll ask a series of questions to our interviewee. And if you have a question um, that you'd like us to ask, please go ahead and type that um, into our Q&A and we'll answer that live in the session. And if we don't get to your question, um, we'll make sure that um, the admissions counselors reach out to you with an answer after the session. So feel free anytime throughout the session to use the um, Q&A box and uh, Nice to have any questions that come up on the fly. So, um, Dean Boone Robinson, um, tell us a little bit. You are an MD, which is which is fantastic, um, when, which is important also for someone who's overseeing um, the North American program for the U.S. and for Canada. So, tell us about your first memory ever of wanting to become a doctor. Can you think way back to young Crystal and what she might have thought about wanting to become a doctor? Um, I think young Crystal probably thought being a doctor was cool. So, actually, I did not want to be a doctor. I wanted to be a um, psychologist. And then I got to college and then um, I was meeting with my advisor who started telling me the difference between a psychologist and a psychiatrist. And I thought I was going to go to medical school to be a psychiatrist. Needless to say, I did one rotation in psychiatry and I was like, no, <laughs> <laughs> not be for me. Uh, but so I would say that, yeah, I always thought that I would help in some type of way with like mental health disorders or something, but I don't really remember like what made me think that I could do that. I don't, um, now I will say, I remember very distinctively what made me decide what type of doctor I would be, right? Um, so I was in, I think this was my sophomore year, of undergrad and I was completing an internship at the University of Louisville for the summer. And my roommate and I, we were both these med student hopefuls. And one of the things that they told us was make sure that you get volunteer hours at a hospital. So that's what we spent our summers doing. And we were at Norton's Hospital in Louisville. And I remember there was this older patient and the a physician came in, she was terminally ill, and he came in and he told her her, you know, her diagnosis and her treatment and everything. And she just kind of like shook her head and um, he left. And when he left, she turned to me and she said, baby, did you understand anything that man said? Because I have no clue. And I'll never forget how I felt at that moment because I was like, wow, like you have no idea what he's doing for you. Uh, you have no idea what type of, you know, radiotherapy you're receiving. You, you have no idea what type of cancer you have. Like, how are you here? How are you receiving this intense therapy with no type of education? And that's when I knew I would just be a physician who my main goal was going to be education. So if you were in my practice, you were walking out with a hypertensive lecture, like, you're going to understand hypertension before you get this pill. Yeah. So that was, uh, 
that's the type of physician. And I remember that very distinctively of I'm going to be a teacher. Yeah. But I did not think I was going to be here. <laughs> I'll say that. <laughs> well, I mean, for the record, I think you would have made a good psychiatrist too. Um, but I'm glad that you didn't. And I'm glad that you had that experience and decided that teaching was for you. So yeah, do like, tell us, how did you end up here? How did you end up at yeah. Maui? So I always tell everybody, cause it's kind of, you know, it's like, I'm very transparent. So I was reading this random article that talked about, uh, you know, paying off student debt and how, um, you know, my generation needed, you know, odd jobs. And I remember reading the article and saying, with what time, like, where do you think we get these additional hours? Like, what do you think we're doing with ourselves? And um, I said, let me just see if there is an online medical school. And sure enough, there was, and it was OUM. And I applied um, and I started off as an advisor. That was the only thing available at the time. So I started off as an advisor. I then went on to become a faculty member teaching alongside you, as you know, uh, we did reproductive and endocrinology. Um, I'd say I was more like your teaching assistant at that point. And then, uh, <laughs> and then we went on uh, to do like, you know, reproductive teaching it on my own or endocrine teaching on my own. And then uh, later became Dean. So yeah. It was kind of this, you know, from 2015 all the way to 2022 when I became dean at the university. Yeah. I was thinking how I've known you for nine years. Yeah. I was, so for this. I was like, oh my gosh, I've known Crystal for almost a decade. <clears throat> That's yeah. fantastic that we still get to work together. Um, okay. So you, you know, you started out just part time, you were doing advising and then we got to teach together, which was fantastic. Um, and now you're both Dean for North America um, and director for clinical education as well, which I want to get into. But tell us a little bit about like why, why is being Dean for North America and why is OUM having a Dean for North America? Like, why is that personally important to you? Yeah. So um, as someone who went to a foreign medical school, one of the things that I try to be is present. Uh, so Every student will know my name. They'll know how to contact me. They'll know that I have like this open door policy where you honestly can take a meeting with me, whether you're in your preclinical years or you're getting ready to walk across the stage, you can contact me. Um, so the idea of a dean in North America that understands what it means to be a foreign medical grad coming into the U.S. system. So I I always say, you know, the U.S. system, if you were to look at it on paper, it has one route to becoming a physician. It tells you you have to complete all your education in the U.S. at a brick and mortar school and then you become a physician. But we know that's not true. If you look at the residency match, there are thousands of people that are trained in foreign medical uh, schools across the world who come back to the United States every year and secure a residency position and are um, practicing physicians, right? So, and a matter of fact, uh, AAMC has even come out to say that these people are critical to the infrastructure of medicine in the United States. It is they like we cannot educate all of the physicians that we need in the United States. We just don't have that infrastructure. We need for medical schools to supply us more physicians and for these physicians to want to move to the U.S. and work. Uh, so we, you know, for somebody to understand that and then be able to navigate that with you, I think is important. And that's what I feel like my role as dean is, is to make sure that I understand what it takes to be successful in trying to return back to the United States and secure residency or even return to Canada and secure residency. Yes, because we have the same problem here in Canada. We just do not have enough spots to educate the number of doctors that we need. So um, one of the reasons I really like working at OUM is we fulfill that need. Yeah. And I, I'm very biased because I want everyone to go into like rural community medicine and I know not everyone will do that, but there's yeah. a real need in the U.S. and in Canada for that to happen. So yeah. we, we help fulfill that need. Um, so you were speaking a little bit about, you know, how 
um, students when they, um, they're at a US medical school versus an, an international medical school, they have to go through you know, a set of requirements. Is the set of requirements that students have to go through at OUM different from a set of requirements that a student would have to go through if they were at like a bricks and mortar medical school in the United States or in Canada? Okay, so in the United States, the process is a little different. Um, so in the United States, so if we were to con uh, compare like a U.S. brick and mortar to a student who is um, coming in from an IMG, so an international medical graduate, mm -hmm. uh, the, everybody has to take the U.S. MLE. So the licensure exams are exactly the same. No matter where you graduate, everybody's going to take U.S. MLE step one, step two. What's going to be different is going to be the need for ECFMG certification. So ECFMG certification does require some additional steps on top of your licensure exams. One of them is your oral English language test. So you will have to take what they call the OET. Um, you also will have to, well, if at OUM, we qualify for pathway three, which is an OSCE that you have to pass prior to graduation that will also count towards your ECFMG certification. So once you secure, so USMLE step one, step two, OET, and that um, uh, the pathway three, as well as graduate, you'll get ECFMG certification. Now you're at the same exact level as the US graduate. The difference in Canada, however, is that the licensure exams are different, whether you went to a brick and mortar in Canada versus if you are an international medical grad. As an international medical grad, you will have addition, additional licensure exams. So you have an MCCQE as well as a NAC exam that you will take, uh, which are very similar to like step two, USMLE step two, that uh, the US uh, those desiring to practice in the U.S. would take. And then the M, uh, the NAC exam is very similar to Pathway 3, which is an OSCE exam that you would have to take. The only difference is that both of these are hosted by um, the medical societies in Canada. Thanks. I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice today. Um, so just for those of you who are kind of like early on in your journey and seeking out medical schools and maybe aren't as familiar with some of the terms just just for info if you want to like google these terms later and do some research yourself so usmle stands for united states medical licensure exams so there are different steps for those exams so have a look at the website on that if you want to know a little bit more about the usmle um, ecfmg is the education commission for foreign medical graduates so they have a lot of information for students who um, attend foreign medical schools, of which OUM is one, we're based in Samoa. Um, and some of the other acronyms, OSCE is the Objective Structured Clinical Exam. It's your like final hurrah exam um, at the end of medical school. And it's really structured for those of you who are in Canada to help you prepare for the NAC, which is a, which is a national OSCE exam. Um, and I think that's, I think that's all the acronyms. MCCQE is the Medical Council of Canada Qualifying Examination. Um, so if you're in Canada and you want to look that up, um, I would go to the Medical Council of Canada website and get some more information um, on that if you're curious. And our um, admissions team that has a lot of information and kind of structured pathways, if you want some more information from them about what applies to you based on where you happen to live and where you want to practice. Um, uh, Dean Boone Robinson, there's a question in the Q&A that's related to what we're chatting about, and it's from Anonymous. And they're, they're asking, can North American applicants apply to be in the standard pathway and not the USMLE pathway? And again, for those of you who are kind of new on your journey, um, if you go into the USMLE website, you'll see that there are actually two pathways. Um, for education at OUM, one is the standard pathway, and the other is the USMLE or the US Medical Licensure Examination Pathway. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to you, Dean Boone Robinson, to answer that question. Can North American applicants apply to be in the standard pathway and not the USMLE pathway? 
So unfortunately at this time, um, it they cannot. So it is based off of your uh, where you reside when you apply. So if you are an Australian student, you would automatically, for example, be enrolled in the standard pathway. However, if you wanted to, at that point, you could appeal to the academic board and say, hey, I wanna go to the USMLE pathway. However, if you are in the US, for example, you are automatically enrolled in the USMLE. You could appeal to the academic board as well, but this isn't something that we've ever done. I will say that simply because one is easier than the other. So for example, if you were to go through the USMLE pathway and then you said, hey, but I still wanna practice in Australia, it's very easy for you to turn around and still um, meet all of the Australian licensure requirements in order for you to uh, qualify for training in the country with your USMLEs, as well as in New Zealand with your USMLEs. If you were, however, doing the opposite where you said, hey, I'm in the standard pathway, I don't want to do any of these exams, and then you were to say, I want to practice in the U.S., it would be very, very challenging for you to get those USMLEs and meet the U.S. requirements for ECFMG certification. So again, it is something that we just guarantee all our U.S. graduates, or, and again, I should say North American graduates, because whether you're in Canada or you're in the United States, you will have a very similar pathway. The only difference is our Canadian graduates, we do veer you into your residency match. So we say that, you know, here goes uh, some resources to help you prepare for MCCQE. Here goes some resources to help you prepare for NAC. Um, whereas the students who say, I want to stay in the United States are going to get resources for step two and resources for pathway three, which so is their musky. Yeah. Is it just us being mean? Like, we're just like, yeah, you, you live here, so you have to take the U.S. Emily. Like, is there a reason why we're putting people into this pathway? Yeah, I think to be 100% honest, I think it's just based off of the accreditation, right? Um, that we are meeting the accreditation standards for our place where we practice, as well as probably most important is that you have to go into clinical rotations and our clinical rotations in the United States, all our agreements say that we are sending you um, a student with step one knowledge. So this is the minimum amount of knowledge that this student has when they come to your rotation on day one, uh, which in the United States is regarded as a healthy amount of medical knowledge to begin clinical training. Now, um, again, it, could this be done? Could you say, oh my gosh, I, I really want to go to New Zealand? We would tell you that you need to live in New Zealand in order to do that uh, pathway. Um, so it's not just us being mean, we do have a reason. <laughs> we have a reason. It's a, it's a lot more complicated. Like I said, a lot of it does uh, boil down to not only our contracts that we have, like our agreements for clinical rotations, but it also does um, really weigh on the fact of like student success in the U.S., right? So when you come in and you're speaking with your advisors, this is your admission counselors, I should say, uh, when you're speaking with them, they will start to tell you about that journey of day one all the way to graduation. So you have to kind of understand that if you're a U.S. student, this is what your pathway looks like. If you're a Canadian student, this is what your pathway looks like, right? Um, if you're an Australian student, this is what your pathway looks like. So you understand what it's going to take in order for you to be able to practice in your country. And that's the pathway that you're enrolled in from the time you get here to the time that you leave. I mean, if we could make medicine easier, we would. Yeah. But would. That's, <laughs> medicine is not easy. So, <laughs> so instead, we just prepare you yep. for the things that you need so that you can be a safe clinician in a successful practice. Absolutely. Um, okay. So, um, you know, the USMLE pathway will culminate with the USMLE steps, which are the licensure, you know, exams in the US, but we don't just like throw our students into them. Can you talk a little bit about what we do to prepare students to take those examinations? Yeah, so um, there's a lot that we do to help you prepare. Matter of fact, we're getting ready 
at the end of this month to have a meeting with our preclinical students. Well, we're meeting with everybody, but the message for the preclinical students will be getting them to start preparing for their USMLEs and giving them steps and different tips and tricks that we've gained throughout the years that we've been running the USMLE um, prep program. But once you're done with your clinical transition units or yeah, halfway through your clinical transition units, you will come to us where you will do your USMLE prep program and we give you everything that you need to be successful. Uh, and this is all already in your tuition. You don't have to worry about what's the cost. Um, no, we've already accounted for all that. So you sit down with us. We have USMLE advising. We have interactive sessions where you get to sit down with a facilitator that goes uh, through questions based off of your areas of weakness. Uh, this is based off of not only testing that you're currently doing while you're with us, but this is also based off of just your own feedback, right? So you know I'm really bad in neuroscience and we sit down and we go through questions with you in neuroscience. It's okay, that's a weak area for a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna the story. Um, so we have a question in our Q&A um, and they ask the USMLE program provided by OUM, are we able as individuals to take a test in these programs after self-studying to see if we are ready to take the USMLE due to the months required for the program? I'm willing to do the study. Can you please advise? Yeah, so I've actually had this question come. So we've never thought about this. I'll be honest, uh, till recently, we've started to really, really think about it because, uh, you know, we know that the preclinical team is doing such an excellent job with preparing the students for USMLE. The students are actually using USMLE resources right now alongside their lectures and they're like, oh, this is basically the same thing. So they feel like they're learning so much that I do feel like, yeah, ask me this question next summer and we'll probably have a, a better procedure for that. But right now, nothing's out of the door. Like we don't say you have to sit down for X amount of months and study. We have a max time that you can study, which is 180 days. However, we never said that you have to use all 180. If all you need is 30, yeah, let's let's see. If you can pass the test and that's all you needed, then 30 it is. Yeah, there's nothing stopping you from doing that. So um, if there's a student, so we do require that all students take uh, the National Board of Medical Examiners, their comprehensive basic science exam, and they do have to reach a certain uh, score on that. If you were to, let's say, get out of your preclinical and you're like, you know, I really, really want to sit for this exam, we'll let you go ahead and take a shot. Like nothing, like what harm is it, right? And if you went in there and you just blew it out the water because you really have spent the last two and a half years preparing, we'll certify you for your exam. And yeah, it just took you 15 days. That's okay. Nobody would stop that. We would, I would actually celebrate yeah. it. I would be in all my meetings bragging. Okay. Um, <laughs> like, so yeah, we could do it. Absolutely. The only thing it makes me think of is that students are always asking about how to shorten the program, right? Like, can I do this so I can get this done faster? Can I do this so I can get that done faster? What would you say to students who are like trying to like minimize the amount of time that they would need to spend before they get to the point of being able to take their licensure exams and OSCE and so on and so forth? Yeah. So again, really good question because I met with one of the USMLE students, um, two weeks ago and brilliant student, just like brilliant, like the way they performed in all their um, classes leading up to their preparation. And um, I asked them, you know, you're here, you've almost hit this like point. What would you tell yourself, right? And they've now been studying uh, about four months. And what would you tell yourself? Like what if you had to give yourself advice, what would you say? And they said, I would say, slow down. That's the one thing. And I was shocked. Like, 
this person is not a slow down person. Okay. Um, so I was completely blown away, like to the point where I said, Hey, when you pass the exam, do you mind like doing a like talk for <laughs> to the university about this? Yeah. Because the reality is, is that, um, and then they went on to explain to me that they're, when they looked at everything, they were like, I have my family, I have this goal, I have this, I have this, I have like all these boxes that I want to check. And it's like, I kept on rushing myself to the point where I'm four months studying for this test. And the reality is, I know if I would have slowed myself down, I would have gotten this test in two months. But I just like in the beginning, I was rushing through the information and not allowing myself to capture the information in the way that I needed it. I needed to in order to be successful. So I will tell you that I know everybody says they want to get to this point and they think they're going to get into the prep program and boom, they're going to be able to do USMLE and it's just not the case. So I will take any challenge that you guys have for yourself, meaning if you say, hey, I think I'm ready, I'll let you challenge yourself. But at the same time, I would tell you, stay in the moment, learn your information properly and slow down. Stop taking so much time trying to look so far ahead. Because, um, you know, and I'll say this here in full transparency too, is that the USMLE is a hurdle at our university. So those who cannot pass the USMLE may get dismissed from the university. So it's very important that you understand that you can't start thinking about clinicals and you haven't figured out your plan of how I'm gonna study for step one. Like you've already figured out, oh, well, when clinicals comes, I'm going to move here. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to change this schedule. I'm going to stop working. I'm going to do that. But then you didn't say when I need time to study for USMLE step one, I'm going to stop working. I'm going to give myself 14 hour days of studying. I'm going to, you know, drop the baby off at mom. I'm going to ask mom to watch the baby, whatever it might be. It's like, you've done all that planning for clinicals, but you haven't done it for your USMLE step one, but USMLE step one will require more of you than that time. Trust and believe it will. And it's because that time is spread out over, you know, two years, whereas USMLE, it's like the sooner you can get it done, the better. So in the spirit of taking things once one thing at a time, I'm going to like back us up a little bit because we're yeah. USMLE doesn't even really start till you're halfway through the program. So I want those of you who are here who are starting in our 2042 cohort. Hi, nice to see you again. Looking forward to welcoming you at orientation in a couple of weeks. Um, and for those of you who are at different points in your journey around becoming a medical student, I want you to be aware of like the steps that it actually takes to get through. So, I mean, the first part is getting admitted to the university and then starting your preclinicals, then going into a clinical transition unit where you're starting to apply some of the skills that you've learned in the preclinicals, then doing your US and LICEPs and then clinical rotation. So a lot of students, um, are at the point that many of you are at where they haven't quite started yet or they haven't even got through the application process and they're already thinking about where, where am I going to do my clinical rotations? So I want to like talk a little bit about these other steps too. So, I mean, we do have a preclinical part that's about two to two and a half years, depending on, you know, how quickly you can get yourself through it. Um, and, and for students to get into the preclinical, also have to like get through the admissions process. So, you know, what should students be thinking about if they're just at the point of the admissions process? Like, what are some of the things that, some of the considerations that they should have before they even think about starting medical school? Yeah, before you think about starting medical school, I would tell you to number one, check your support system. Uh, that is probably the most critical piece of getting through medical school is you have to have um, support. And what I mean by support is obviously not everybody's going to be super happy that you're going back to school, right? Um, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying those who count the most to you, if it's your significant other, for example, that they're on board with you sacrificing time, money, right? 
uh, you need to make sure that they really understand what they're getting themselves into. Uh, and then you, right? You taking that time to really say, is this something I want to do? Because it is going to be a lot of time. And I always, you know, have this conversation with my students when they start to talk about like, oh my God, I didn't realize how much time it would take. I always tell them, you know, the idea of time being taken away from your personal life and you having to now do this weird juggle with like medicine and family starts in medical school and it continues on in your training and it'll continue on in practice. It's just kind of the nature of the specialty is that there is a lot of sacrifice that comes with this specialty and it's very rewarding, but you have to understand if you're willing to do that and if your family and your support system is willing to go on that journey with you. That's the very first thing I would say. The second thing I would say is to check your resources. And anytime I say resources, everybody automatically thinks that I'm talking about finances. Yes, absolutely. You need to make sure that you know how you're going to pay for your education. That is very important that you understand, okay, this is how much I have in savings. This is how much I need to earn. This is like you've actually sat down and you've budgeted that out. And um, make sure when you create that budget that you're putting in realistic things like, what if um, my significant other loses their job? What if, uh, you know, my child gets sick? Do you have that emergency fund or are you considering that emergency fund part of your tuition? Because uh, life happens, right? And we've seen it here at the university where students are almost done and life happens and they have to take a, a pause, right? So I want you to understand that, but not only financial resources, but resources in time and your mental capacity. <laughs> Do not come to us if you're already tapped in life, right? Like if life has just hit you really hard, like you've recently gone through a traumatic experience, medical school is not the best thing to pick up at that moment, right? Like you might say, now I feel the most motivated, but really understand what you're getting yourself into, right? So check in those overall resources, those things that are going to supply you as you get through medical school. That's what I mean by resources. So those are my top two, your support system and your resources, checking them, understanding them, before you ever hit that application button. And then obviously the admissions counselors have, you know, the list of the wonderful documentations and different things that you need in place. But yeah, those are the main things. I think it's really important what you mentioned about like life happens and changes that happen in life that are unpredictable. And you almost have to like think about and plan for things that you never expect are gonna happen, right? And this is actually what, this is like my job. This is something that I deal with with students every single day is something unexpected has happened. Now we've got to make a shift or a pivot or some kind of accommodation to support the fact that you've had like some life change that you couldn't predict. Um, but it's never the best like thought if like you already have that happening, don't put medical school on top of that resolve that first and then come forward in a good position of mental mental resources and time and space. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's say if someone's got their support system in place, they've thought through resources, they've done some planning around that, um, and they decide to um, apply. And a really common question that we get are like, should I prepare? Like, should I be like taking courses? Like, should I be reading books? Like what will make me like prepared to start medical school? What would you, what would be your recommendation to those kinds of questions? So, um, I love that you got a big smile. Like, <laughs> okay. As if you could actually ever prepare. Yeah, that's why, yeah, like there's no preparation. Like no matter who you are, it will still hit you like a, like a dump truck. Like we always talk about like medical school feeling like you're drinking, you know, out of a fire hose. It really comes that fast. And unless like you've experienced it, it's very, very hard to even explain it to someone. Uh, but I will say this, that the best way to prepare is exactly the same things that we just said. 
put yourself in a good mental space, spend as much time with your family, friends, do your vacations, do those things that you love to do with your loved ones. Um, because once you start, you're going to like be saying a lot of no, sorry, I can't make it. Sorry, I can't do this tonight. Sorry. Like you're going to find yourself constantly doing that, like constantly having to turn people down and constantly having to make a sacrifice after a sacrifice. So enjoy life. That that would be like my number one thing is <laughs> preparation. But second thing I would tell you is um, if it's been a while since you've been in school, it doesn't hurt to pick up like a medical school book or something. And I always tell people, don't go crazy with like medicine and start Googling like how to do well on USMLE step one, cause you're not there yet, right? Like don't go, <laughs> like you're not there. Don't, don't, don't stress yourself out. But a yeah. good book to like start yourself on that I do think um, a lot of people could read and it'll start to give you a foundation to medicine is a physiology book. And I always remember, I always like talk about the Linda Costanza book, uh, but that's because I'm very biased. That's my favorite book. However, it, I like it too. Yeah. <laughs> like, go oh girl. Yeah. And so the, got great videos too. Yeah. Very good videos. Like there's so many resources. So that's like my number one thing. Like if you wanted to do something and you're like, okay, I've got into medical school. I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. I feel like I should be doing something. Um, I would tell you do that. It wouldn't hurt. Yeah. And for those of you who are, you know, starting in a few weeks now, um, if you're already registered and enrolled and got your OUM credentials, you can go into clinical key um, in the OUM library and check out Constanza Physiology if you, if you so choose after our webinar today. Um, and for those of you who are, you know, not starting um, in a few weeks, uh, just for your information that we have an online library and all of our textbooks for all of our courses are in that library and has wonderful resources and you can check out some of the features on clinical key on your own if you're if you're interested to know more okay so you've you've gotten everything um in order you've applied you have spent the time before you started medical school living your life and making advance apologies to people about how little they're going to see over the next five years uh, I like this. Maybe it's just the social media that I'm on, but it's about it's like stopping saying I'm sorry for this. And then instead of thanking people, thank you so much for understanding that my life is insane right now. I really appreciate your support and building your support system. Anyways, think, think about that if you like. Okay, so all of that fine and dandy. You get to go to orientation. You get to meet um, Dean Boone Robinson again and some of our student ambassadors, if you haven't had a chance and you're interested to talk with a student about their experience, I recommend reaching out and admissions counselors can get, a get you in touch with our student ambassadors. And then finally start. Yep. So, so all, all that going aside, we have to start in the preclinical curriculum. And we have this like general principles course um, that students take first. Um, and that some people get like very nervous about having to take this course. What would you like, what would advice would you give people who are going to have to take and are going to be taking general principles course at the beginning of their medical student journey? Oh my gosh. Simply just, uh, understand your schedule. Yeah. So that's the other thing that I should say is, um, with preparation too, is to really make sure that you have a very good study schedule in place. And I think you'll be completely fine. Yes. Well, general principles, like no matter who you are, we've had pharmacists in the program, we've had, you know, veterinarians and, you know, teachers, yeah. teachers, yeah. Friends, friends, and peace, yeah. lawyers, all kinds of musicians. Like there's, there's so many different, no matter who you are, when you ask, Ask every single one of them, they're like, yeah, I wasn't prepared, right? I think it's just the idea that medical school is really different than any degree you've ever uh, received. So no matter what, there's no like preparation or anything you can say other than I know these are the hours I can study. And just make sure you lock in those hours and those hours are really uninterrupted. Like don't have you know, a schedule where it's really dependent on, you know, your kids, if their football practice runs over, because it typically runs over every hour. So 
I'm going to, you know, don't do that to yourself. Have it like solid hours. These are protected. Uh, nothing can really interrupt these except for emergencies. And uh, for those of you who are starting in a couple of weeks, Dr. Okeke and myself have a set of study skills for success sessions planned for you um, on the 18th and 20th of June if you're in North America and then on the 19th and 21st um, if you're in Australia, New Zealand and Samoa. So we encourage you to, to join us or to look at those recordings um, and to get in touch with a student success advisor um, to help you put together your study plan once you've um, gotten through. So a lot of people want to know like, well, when it's an online university for the preclinical part. And then you're doing in-person kind of clinical stuff. So when do you actually like, um, for the preclinicals, like when do you actually go to class and what like amount of time do you actually need? So um, like, what should students expect? Like, do they actually have to go to class or like, is everything just, you know, online and recorded and they, they can just, you know, do things whenever they want and we're completely flexible. Oh, no, you you have to go to class. Yeah, <laughs> we're still a university. Um, so, yeah, you we do have live classes every single week. Um, these live classes, we like to say that these are student led. These are interactive sessions. So you are looking at about six hours of interactive learning. Um, it could go up to roughly about eight hours, uh, depending on some more tutoring and other things that may be in place with the instructors and this is just really instructor dependent. Um, they might have like a session that they've added to assist students with concepts that are a little bit more challenging. Uh, but the main sessions are going to be those three sessions that are going to focus around um, students interacting with students and an instructor. So it's really that student led learning if, um, you don't show up this session. And really, when you look at the sessions, the sessions are only as good as like the amount of students who come and they're like super engaged. Like we can get a lot of students in the classroom and they're not engaged and you're going to feel a difference than when you get students in a class and they're super engaged. They love the material. They're just really excited to learn. You're going to notice your experience is so much more improved. So yeah, it's student-led learning. Um, now, I want to say, because I think whenever people hear student-led learning, they think that we're like leaving you out there by yourself. No, there's always facilitators in the room um, that are there to make sure that you hit certain objectives. By the end of the evening, you would have walked away with this much learning, and they will make sure through the student learning um, objectives that you've hit all of those, and they'll guide you. Trust me, it's kind of you know, it's like somebody whispering in your ear and, yeah. and when you say this, you know, it's a, <laughs> exactly think this way. Right. It's it's very similar. But um, yeah, it's six hours a week of student led learning. Now, overall, because we are medical school, you should say that I need roughly and this is honest to God on the low end of studying about 40 hours of study time. Um, and this does not include those six hours of like coming to class, right? You're saying I need 40 hours of study time. Yep. Yeah, I think too, it's not just you sit, you're going to sit and read a textbook or watch a video for 40 hours. When we say study time, we mean active learning engagement with the material for at least 40 hours a week. Um, yeah. And that, that makes a, that is like a big learning curve that like as they get into general principles people are like oh I can't just write flashcards and memorize things like I did in prior degrees I actually have to learn and integrate this material if I'm going to be able to um you know pass my courses and pass my licensure exams and practice medicines yeah and I like how you said that like I think that's one of the biggest differences in um, medicine versus other degrees is the fact that our classes are linked, right? So what you learn in cardiovascular will be important for your understanding in urinary. And those two classes together will be important for your understanding in pulmonary. And how well you capture those concepts in those classes will 
equate to how well and how easy you think pulmonary is, to be honest, right? So it's, it's, I can tell you that learning the information well the first time is always going to be your best bet in medicine, because if not, it comes back and it bites you. Um, and I can, uh, you know, Dr. McGuire and I, we review exams for other courses that we're not a part of. And we're always like, oh, well, this was taught here, you know, like <laughs> we we know like, yes, you guys are saying it was taught again with you, but we know like they should have known this also from this course too. Like it would have been integrated knowledge and um, had they actually remembered it, for example, from Dr. McGuire's course, then they would have had enough information to get it right in, you know, another person's course. So I will tell you that medicine is, integrated and you must learn it well the first time in order to do well in medicine just all together so your licensure exams as well as just clinical practice and being you know a competent physician yeah don't don't skimp on your learning of type 2 diabetes um, <laughs> <laughs> so i mean what is like maybe the, this is a i'm just going to ask this question like what is the point of all of that? Like of drinking all this fire hose of information in the preclinicals, like why is it so important that you learn so many specific details and be able to integrate them across systems? Like why do you need that information in order to go into clinical practice? Oh, so it's uh, the big difference here for those especially who have other types of health degrees is that we focus on the medical model of learning. So uh, medical school is what, you know, is the basis of the medical model, which basically says that there's these basic sciences or there's these foundational principles that run how we think in medicine. So when I see a patient come in and they have this symptom and this symptom, how do I actually link those systems, those symptoms together? Like, am I actually looking at it and saying, oh, this is only pulmonary, or do I understand that this is more than pulmonary? This could also be cardiovascular. So it helps me be able to understand what we call differentials. So this is when a patient comes in, we never in medicine, and this is despite what everybody thinks, um, and this is what makes medicine a little hard, is that when you go in and you see a physician, a physician doesn't say, aha, you absolutely have this, right? Um, they always say, you know, based off of everything that you're telling me, we believe that you may be experiencing this, right? So they'll use some type of language, essentially telling you that the, this is your most likely diagnosis. However, they recognize in the background that they're going to try to roll out some other things and they might actually have that conversation with you, right? They might actually say, you know, but because you've been experiencing this for the last X years, you might also be experiencing this. So in order for me to make sure that I roll this out, I'm going to do this test. But again, based off of this, I do believe this is your most likely. So medicine is based off of my understanding that we never truly know what you have. And instead, I'm working from a differential. I'm saying this is the most likely and I'm ruling out some things right behind it. And this is where my investigations come in. This is also where even my management may come in. I might tell you, okay, rest for a couple of days. If it continues, then this lets me know that this is actually number two on my list and not number one, like I thought it could be, right? Um, so that's where that foundation comes from. And in order for you to be able to do that well and do it very quickly, like the person just arrived to the emergency room, what's everything that I'm thinking? What's everything that I want? It starts with the foundations. And I know like whenever we talk to students in like the preclinical years, um, like cardiovascular, for example, is one of your first organ systems, like students are very like, ah, this is not a thing. And then we like capture those same students about like five organ systems later, and they like totally can already do it. They're already like start to say, oh, well, you know, I see that she's experiencing this, so I don't want to rule out this fact. And it's like their brain is already doing it. And they they don't even realize they're doing it. And it's so, so where do I see that at? Just to kind of give you guys um, 
a plug because I'm also uh, the lead instructor for that is a PBL. So we have problem-based learning where you will get a case and we will ask you to apply the medical model to how you approach this patient and how you come up with not only what's happening with this patient, but also how you come up with, you know, a plan, like what you're going to do for this patient. So um, in the beginning, cardiovascular, it seems like, oh, what's happening? And then you guys get down the line and you're, you're rocking it out. And it's so impressive to see that growth. Yeah. All starts to click. Absolutely. Okay. Well, let's, let's do talk a little bit about clinical stuff because people want to know about that too. Um, and because you're director for clinical education as well. So tell me a little bit about, you know, clinical rotations in the U S where are they? How much do they cost? How do students get a clinical rotation in the U S and Canada? Yeah, so very good. So um, we do have multiple agreements across the U.S., but the one that we always tell students without a doubt is going to be Chicago. And everybody always says, why, if you have agreements located in other states, why do you not advertise those? Is because they are smaller agreements and they usually come with like certain restrictions. Like they might say that hey, this person has to be a resident of this state. Um, this It might also come with a restriction saying that we need this person to have this kind of background, for example. Um, those are very few and far between, but they do happen. So uh, when you meet with me, we can have that conversation a little deeper of if they're within your state, do we have one of those agreements? Uh, but Chicago, we always say because Chicago is a metropolitan area, right? So if one physician moves away, there's like another, you know, family medicine guy like next door to him, right? Uh, whereas some of our other contracts are located at smaller hospitals where if the obstetrician moves away, it might be like seven months before they get another OB. So that's why we we don't really advertise those to students. However, they do exist. Um, the other point that I want to make is Chicago is where we send you as far as like this is who the school is going to send you to. You can if you have connections close to home, we can work with you to stay close to home. Now, again, there's no promises being made there, but we do work with students to help establish contracts in cities close to them. And we have done this numerous times and students have been able to, you know, stay within like a 30 mile radius to their home and get their rotations done. So we will work with you to stay closer to home if that is your desire. It's not a guarantee, but yeah. I think that's not something that you would find in any school <laughs> where they will say, yes, I will work with you specifically to see if we can make an agreement that is close to the area where you live, which I think is great. Um, okay, so that that is good for the rotations that are in the US and Canada. And because we are Samoan Medical School, all of our students do a rotation in Samoa as well. Um, and um, we have someone who asked specifically, they're an executive looking for um, a career change and the pathway makes the transition seem doable. And they said um, for their question, I have eight children. So the thought of doing a rotation in Samoa sounds like it would be very difficult for my kids. Is there any way to replace this with another rotation? If there's no way, is there a way to schedule it for a specific time and not interfere with their school schedule? So can you tell us a little bit about like the summer rotation, what the requirements for that are, and a little, maybe even just say a little bit about this, this potential and prospective student has children, a number of children. We do have other students with children, what that's kind of like, how, how people schedule around that. Yeah, so first of all, woo! That's a lot of kids. Uh, <laughs> no, I have two. They must have really good time management. So that's yeah, a very yeah. good time management. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a very good. So um, first, I will say double check your sanity before coming to medical school because children will test it, right? But on a serious note, you do have to understand that um, medical school, 
will again. I talk about that sacrifice. Samoa is one of those sacrifices that I think a lot of North Americans with families have to consider that there will be a minimum of a month that you will have to go away from your family uh, to Samoa. It is only a minimum of a month. And I say a minimum because if you wanted to spend eight weeks there, 12 weeks there, we will work with you to stay in Samoa longer. However, um, the university currently only requires that you go for four weeks. Now, as far as scheduling, this is another thing that we have been great with. And I will tell you across the university, probably our coolest side of the university is probably our Samoan side. Like, they're just a little bit more chill. I don't know if it's the They're sun. So thing. nice. So <laughs> nice. I don't know why. <laughs> it's like, why are y'all so happy? Like, what's happening over there? Um, but, you look at it. It's amazing. Beautiful. Yes, it is. <laughs> You're, I mean, they're funny. Like, all of them, like, if you guys have ever had an opportunity to interact with our vice chancellor, it's like a, like a real funny guy. Like, he doesn't even try. He just talks and it's funny it's like I'm like this is a weird personality like how does this just exude out of you guys they're they're really good people so I say that to simply say that um they are willing to work with you meaning if you say I need this rotation to be in the month of July because I need to be back by August um to make sure I can help with preparation for school They'll work with you and they'll start you on whatever that first Monday in July is and get you out by that last Friday in July. They will work with you to make sure that, trust me, it will not, they will say, you know, we're leaving this open for you and this is the time that you can come. Now, Samoa, let me, I'm going to also do something for Samoa. Samoa is by far our best rotation opportunities. There is no better experience than the experience that you're going to get in Samoa. And especially when compared to the North American experience, I'm going to tell you that because I think everybody who sits on the North American side understands how politicized our medicine is, right? And we have all this like liability, this liability, that round mile pack, this, this. So your limit as a medical student to do things has really been taken away, right? So there you go to OBGYN, you're not touching that newborn. Uh-uh, that's, a, no, you're not, right? Uh, whereas you go to Samoa, they're like, here, come on, sit down. I'm gonna, we're gonna, I'm gonna do this one time. And then the next time you're catching the baby. And um, it's like, they, they just believe in that hands-on training of medicine. And that's the way we used to be, right? So it's the best way to learn medicine. Everything is hands-on. There's very little observation. So if you feel like you're going to be standing in the corner watching a physician do something, absolutely not. They're going to be like, uh-uh, go get gloved up. Go, go get in here. You're you're now my um, helper in this surgery, right? So I will tell you that Samoa is the best learning experience. There's no better learning experience that the university could offer other than what you're going to get at TTM. I have talked to pretty much every single OUM student about their experience in Samoa, and I have never heard a negative review about the clinical experience that they had when they were there. Never, not once. Yeah, not once. Um, and I just wanted to just add on to one of the things that you said as well, which is um, about, you know, that we will kind of go out of our way to accommodate you, and because we're a smaller school, we really do treat our students as individuals and we do go out of our way to accommodate individuals when they have, you know, a particular extenuating circumstance that has a particular requirement. So we have, we have things in place to do that. Okay, so we're at, we're at the end, but I have one last question that I do want to ask you and Mesh has asked it, asked it as well. Um, and I wanted to ask about matching into residency in the U.S. and in Canada. So can you tell um, our attendees today a little bit about some of the supports that we provide for our students to get that ultimate goal, which is matching into residency in an area of their interest? Yeah, so I think our support, like I said, starts when day one, supporting our preclinical students to make sure that they're doing everything that they need to do in order to 
uh, successfully pass USMLE Step 1 on your first go. That's going to be your first requirement uh, for residency. And then after that, it's going to be making sure that we're aligning you with the right people along the way so you can network during your clinical rotations, know what you're supposed to, whose hand you're supposed to be shaking, what events you're supposed to be at in order for you to be successful uh, when you start applying. And again, we offer up that uh, USMLE Step 2 preparation, the MCCQE um, help and guidance, as well as the NAC help and guidance uh, in order for you to be successful in those like documentation requirements. But as far as, you know, the who you know game, uh, we help you play that who you know game as well. Uh, we've, you know, worked with students with helping them know where to network, who to network with, We've set up a small network of residents that students tap into uh, to help make sure that when residency starts that their applications can be pulled, as well as we have this whole residency series. And again, because, and I do think, like I always think back, like if I was at a larger university as a dean, would I really have all these additional programs in place? I'm not sure, like I, I don't know, but I will tell you it is the beauty of OUM. And if even if OUM blows up one day and it has, you know, thousands of people, I think that it's gonna always understand that these support programs were why it was successful, right? Like, I, I honestly believe that it will always hold true to the fact that it needs to support the students. So we have a residency series that is dedicated to helping you fill out your applications, personal statements, we get them copy edited so you're not sending it off um, with grammatical errors or even with like, you know, we check it for the tone, like we'll tell you that you sound, you know, aggressive or could you change the wording in this? Um, we have mock interviews for you where you get to meet with uh, those involved in the residency process and they interview you, they tell you, you know, they give you real feedback, the way you're holding your body, the way you're answering questions, your pauses, your tone, you, you name it, we're giving you like that full one on one experience. Um, and then, of course, we support you along the way with just that phone call whenever you feel like you're not going to make it because I feel like that's also important is uh, knowing that somebody is your cheerleader and um you know, when you feel like, oh my God, I, I I, just don't know if I've gone through all this and it's not going to be successful. You have somebody just like sitting back there and telling you it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. You're going to make it. You're going to make it. Right. So you do have that cheerleading that also exists as part of our process. And then as you know, this year, we were very proud that we were able to push everybody through. So 100% match. And I really think it's because we ran that support system like to the ground. I mean, we really supported the students so much through their process um, from late night calls to early morning calls to, you know, supporting them with documentation and whatever else they felt like they needed to be successful, we made a way to make sure each individual candidate could have what they needed to be successful. They're all so amazing. Yeah. They're all great. Um, I just want to encourage, um, if you want to know more um, kind of about residency, not you, Dean Robinson, but those of you who are joining us, if you want to know a little bit more about residency and the student experience and support, um, I really encourage you to um, watch our uh, Meet the Alumni webinar with uh, Dr. Carol Jesse. She goes into that in a little bit more detail um, as well. So maybe you want to follow up uh, this webinar with, a with uh, Dr. Jesse's recording. Um, so Dean Boone Robinson, thank you so much for taking some time today. It's so hard to get time on your schedule. And I know this is outside of, you know, typical North American hours. So I really appreciate that. Um, and I know all of our attendees will join me in thanking you as well. So thank you for doing this. Thank you guys so much. Thank you.
And uh, thanks to all of you who attended today in person and via recording. Um, for those of you who are starting in our 24-2 cohort, looking forward to seeing you again in a couple of weeks. If you had a question and we didn't answer it today, um, please reach out to your admissions counselor if you've already put it in the Q&A, and we'll provide that back to them to make sure that you get the answers you need. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at our next OUM webinar. Thanks so much for joining us. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Nicolette, for hosting this as well. Anytime. <laughs> Bye, everyone.